Today's episode is brought to you by Lawn Culture Australia, an innovative new lawn rewards cup launching on June the 1st. You can win things like cylinder mowers, rotary mowers, lawn care prize packs. I'll tell you more about that later in the podcast. All right, everyone, I've got some updates, tour dates for the national podcast tour. We've got Adelaide, Adelaide Oval Turf Solutions have done an amazing job getting us the event at Adelaide Oval. Damien Hoff, JT from there, and Ben Sims, everyone's favourite lawn YouTuber. Melbourne, we've got Lawns and Good Nick, Ashley James Gardens, Joel Barnett from the Landscaping Podcast, and we can say at Hunter Valley, we have an event sponsored by Lawn Culture. They're the one that's bringing it to you. Brenton from the Aussie Lawn, Joe from Lawn Solutions, Gary Ashton from Aussie Lawn Stars, and Sean from Blade Mate. What a lineup! To find more information, there is a link in the description. Book all the tickets are free. Hopefully, I'll see you there. All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. Um, we have somebody from New Zealand. I don't know what you're doing on the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast, but no, I do. We've got, we've got Blair uh, Eden Park. Was your job head curator? Is that the, is that the term that you have? Uh, turf manager over here on this side of uh, the Tasman. Turf manager for a very long time, and uh, Eden Park's probably the most famous bit of grass in New Zealand, I would say. In my opinion, it is. It's, unless there's something else I'm missing on. No, I'd like to think it is. I mean, probably, you know, with the Bledisloe Cup record, I mean, most Australians will remember Eden Park probably for all the losses they've had since 86. Oh, it comes on the podcast and immediately insults the country of the host. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> You do have a pretty good record over us. I know, I've got I've got no arguments. That's a problem. I can't I can't yeah. say anything back. But uh, do, do you get involved emotionally with the games that you're uh, that you're curating for or turf managing for? Uh, I, not so much emotionally. I've sort of started to take notice of the win record of the All Blacks. Maybe most recently, it, it didn't really form part of your mindset, but now you sort of have this. Um, unbeaten record maybe for 30 years I think it'll be this year in Australia it's even longer and with the cricket you're kind of a little bit more win loss but um, you sort of try and have as many wins as you can without playing. Well I seem to remember a certain World Cup final if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Is that 2015 that was at was that at Eden Park? So 2015 Cricket World Cup opening um, uh, game against Australia. I think it was February 28th or so, something like that. And um, we uh, scraped uh, one wicket win, I think. And I think Mitchell Stark got six and Trent Bolt got six and Williamson hit a six to win the game. But it was sort of in the bag early and then it wasn't. No. So... Didn't we win that final, though? I can't remember. I, oh, should, I, I should have researched. I'm Googling it now. 2015 yeah, World no, the, Cup final. The final was, um, I've erased that. I'm, yes, I'm okay. I'm in Eden Park, Australia, NZ. That was, that was the memorable game. That's right. So Australia dominated in the final, but that, so the final wasn't at Eden Park. I mean, it's eight, it's no, nine final was years ago. MCG. McCullum was aggressive in that tournament, and he he um, fell early, batting first. And I think Taylor and Elliot uh, sort of got to a, a reasonable total, but on that ground, and you know, with it being a big <coughs> venue, hard to defend, wasn't nearly enough. So, Eden Park is the almost the exact opposite of the MCG when it comes to cricket in terms of size, right? MCG is yeah. massive. Oh. Eden, Eden Park is tiny. Um, how do you I go? I call it tiny. Well. We call it fan, fan friendly, you see? <laughs> You've been working with the marketing team on that, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's just so close to the action, you know. So the MCG, while it's, it's a great venue, there's no doubt about it, and it tests you in certain ways, Eden Park also does that, but in different ways. So therefore, they both coexist. No, it, I, I love it because it's uh, – I like that there's 
grounds that have their own flavor. I'm a massive cricket fan for those who don't, uh, don't listen regularly. And if every, if every ground was the same thing, you, you know, you kind of know how a series would go by the first game, you know, but Correct. you can go, well, this ground kind of suits these types of players and this ground doesn't. And every time you go to Eden Park as an Australian fan, you kind of don't know what's going to happen because it is such a unique venue. Yeah, so while every the game is the same, it's played differently at every venue. You know, mm-hmm. so um, you'll have a different style of cricket played at the Wacker versus, say, Sydney. And you know, while it's still called cricket, it's played very differently, and you know, utilizes different players and their skill sets, and you'll see different things at different grounds. And you know, that's the beauty of it. And then that extends through to different countries. Um, so, you know, just the ability for the subcontinent to be so dominant at home yet you know traditionally struggle away Mm -hmm. is the beauty of of a game like cricket do you change the way not change the way that you do it but like because you've been at eden park for a long time you said 20 years or something like that yeah since january 2000 yeah wow Uh, don't change the way don't change the way we prepare cricket pitches as such, but we do um, have a very good understanding of what produces a good pitch. And, you know, we probably stick to what we traditionally have as our own playing characteristics. We don't try and change too much. We build in what I'd like to think is some consistency year in, year out, and even game to game. And so the teams that come and play here have a, a really good understanding of what they're likely to encounter in terms yep. of the surface, and um, that provides a you know a bit of confidence, and um, people can prepare really well, and then you know hopefully deliver that skill set that they are hopefully going to get to to showcase on a pitch that's for twenty years hopefully been pretty consistent. So, would you if you had the MCG next door to you and you were managing both so the same climate same grass same soil types and everything would you prepare them exactly the same way uh, not necessarily I mean we have a first class cricket overall within a hundred meters of our sort of stadium ground and we do prepare them a little bit different and they're only a hundred meters away so like you said right next to each other yeah um, we try for the same outcomes, you know, high quality, um, best pitch we can produce, fair for bat and ball, but we do go about it a little bit differently. Um, but we're still trying to achieve the same outcome, and that's just to try and challenge ourselves to not fall into this um, case of like a, a recipe. I don't like using a recipe. I just like to create an outcome, and however we get to that outcome, is is what we'll do and so we do mix it up a little bit trying to achieve the same outcome do you ever have do you know in the, in, in your mind or do you have a moment in your mind where you go this is the best this is the best cricket pitch <laughs> i've done like this is the one that i'll look back on and be like i'm i'm really happy with how that one went yeah you do during the preparation um i do a lot of like what i describe as pitch monitoring so i'm taking samples out of the pitch and i'm measuring bulk density moisture contents pore saturations things like that and then i can start to tell whether everything is working towards what i'd call like a um i don't know a pre pre-designed um method but it's not until after the match that you sort of go yep nailed it you're pretty uh, on the fence, you can be confident, but you never know. And I've had what I've described as some great pitches have some pretty average games of cricket on them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I'm pretty sure the pitch uh, played its role or you know, it didn't play a role. It was actually, might be the people, not the pitch on that occasion. But yeah. afterwards you can go, yeah, man, nailed that. There's been a few that I've I've liked. Yeah, does any specific tournament, any specific game where you're like, I was really proud of that one? Oh, I mean, there's probably been hundreds if not thousands of cricket pitches 
that I've done now. But in terms of the 2015 Cricket World Cup, those surfaces were all really high yeah. quality and rated highly by the players as well as the ICC. So that was a you know a nice moment. We had that Cricket World Cup uh, semi final with South Africa and New Zealand. So great to have New Zealand playing at home in a semi final. And I think that was you know that at the time it was. 301 off 43 and New Zealand got rain affected chase of 290 odd of 43 or something and so that was a good surface there's a couple of T20s where Australia or I think we whacked 245 and thought that was a world record or it was for half an hour <laughs> and then uh, Darcy Short and Warner went out and, and knocked off 245 so but those surfaces were good um, <laughs> Yeah. The batsman definitely thought so, you know. Oh, yeah, big, big fan of runs. And like I said, fan-friendly, that's what people want to see. And if you come away as a bowler with under 40 for four overs, that's not a bad outing here. No, it isn't, yeah, because cause it's easier to hit, you know, f- bad six, six attempts that would be landing, you know, well within the boundary have a chance at Eden Park. So... It kind of encourages yeah. a certain type of flamboyant, uh, risky, entertaining cricketing style. But also, yeah. if you bowl right, you know some players are able yeah. to manipulate yeah. like that. So different lengths. Yeah, you just bowl different lengths here. So you bowl a little bit um, of a harder length, hard to drive to straight, short straight boundaries, more cross bat shots. Um, and yeah, you just sort of you want the ball to swing, but you don't want to pitch it up too much. So the players do come here with a little bit of anxiety, um, which is always good. Well, there's a little bit of nerdiness getting out of both of us because I mean I know nothing about what your job really is like, but I love cricket, and you know the truth is the further down we get down this nerdiness path, people are going to just tune out, you know, because I'll end up asking yeah, about how much clay. In there, yeah, <laughs> all that sort of stuff, and maybe we'll do that at the end. But the thing that I should have started at the beginning because we, I was distracted by all the technical issues that we had, uh, and people who listen to the podcast are well aware that people were good with grass are not great with cameras and stuff. But yeah. Eden Park, as far as I'm aware, so I'll give a little bit of an introduction it is the kind of the home of a lot of things sport-wise in uh, New Zealand. And you were talking about rugby or football or whatever people call it, you know, over in New Zealand. And then we're talking about cricket. Is this the only stadium, it's the only stadium I can think of, that hosts both the rugby and cricket? Uh, In New Zealand, Wellington Stadium does it as well. So they're a sort of a a replicate of ourselves based out of, the Caketon and Wellington. Um, and so the two venues, ourselves and Wellington, um, kind of replicate the type of content that we do. We just have a bit of a larger scale in terms of 50 plus thousand seats. And there, are, I think there might be 34. So, so what about, is there anything in South Africa, anything in England? So what I'm... No, maybe uh, Marvel in... Melbourne would probably, you know, so they've got a, a big bash Renegades team. They also have uh, the AFL. Um, they might on occasions, I think they used to have uh, A-League football. I'm not sure if they do anymore, but they're probably the only one that sort of switches codes, you know, like we do. Yeah, true. Okay, yeah. The thing I'm getting at, though, is like for cricket, what would make a successful cricket field is flat. Right, and what a rugby player would do to a field is bumpy, and there would be. Um, well, I mean, am I misunderstanding this? Is there more to it? Uh, yeah, there's a bit more to it now. There's technology, so you know, with us, we we're a portable pitch, so we come in and out, um, and we have a carpet backed hybrid system, uh, the HG. Hero, we call it the Eden Park edition. We sort of uh, collabed with the guys out of HG just to sort of make a specific product for our purposes, uh, being a cool season variety versus the warm seasonal transition grasses that they might use in Australia. 
Um, and so that technology within the profile helps um, create a surface suitable for kind of all users, I guess, small ball sports like cricket, but also the the larger football and, and rugby in particular. Yeah. And with that stability, you just don't have the same sort of um, surface disruption uh, that you may used to have with non-stabilized profiles. So what what is your stabilized profile for people who've never heard of it? So, yep, so a stabilized um, profile is a, made up of uh, synthetic fibers. So our field is a 5% um, makeup of synthetic fibers uh, with 95% real grass. The fibers um, come up above the, the ground level 20 millimeters. And uh, so if you were to part the grass, you could just see up to 5% uh, synthetic fibers. And so they're in a carpet backed netting 45 mils below the surface. So right. All major sort of stadium profiles, if you want, are all sand based. There's no soil as such. So um, the grass plant grows within the sand and within the fibers and within the backing network, and it provides this additional stability as opposed to grass plants being just grown in sand or previous generation soil. So just this instantaneous uh, stability for, you know, code to code to code and high traffic, high use, shaded, um, intense use type stuff. So the, the stitching or the, the, the carpet layer, what you would call it, is holding together the soil and is holding together the roots and stuff like that? Is that what's happening? Yep. It holds together the, the roots of the ryegrass in our case um, and stability to the sand. The sand is a sort of a pretty coarse uh granule for want of a better word and it um doesn't have a heap of um instant stability because of that granule large coarse granule shape and size and it's designed and used so that we have um drainage properties so that we can right. move water through a profile really quickly but it just does need you know on occasions depending on its use uh, additional stability and so these fibers do that now and it's probably most modern sports fields would have some sort of fiber component incorporated in them so if you're not using if you so you're just saying it's just sand right in that profile yep with yep, 300 mils of sand sitting on a gravel drainage raft so it's like a a large uh usga golf uh green construction essentially right so a lot of people would say, in especially in the world I'm in, which is sort of mostly residential lawn care, a bit of commercial lawn care, yep. you'd want to be adding organic matter for the sake of not needing as much nutrients and all that sort of stuff. Is the organic matter then, mm -hmm. because you could pick whatever surface you wanted, right? You could do whatever you wanted, yep. you know. What What is organic matter not giving you or what is it taking away that, this, this just a pure sand gives you? So organic matter, we actually try and reduce as much as possible down to probably less than 10% uh, as a measurement. We would not want any more than that in our profile and that um, organic matter slows down uh, water movement in the winter and it increases the, the, the sort of droughting out of a profile in the summer because it doesn't have a lot of uh, water holding capacity or it, it dries out a lot quicker in the summer. Um, so we try and reduce it as much as possible. And then we'll use other um, methods to produce the characteristics that it does, but at the right time. So therefore, in the summer, we might use wetting agents to hold on to water in the profile. Yeah. But we don't want to have organic matter in there because it is um you can't control it whereas the wetting agents we can in terms of their application rates their timing um organic matter can sort of enhance high organic matter can enhance uh particular part, plant types so we want to keep pretty much out in our fields mono sward so it means just just rye grass we have a couple mm -hmm. of different cultivars but we want that mono sward we don't want a mixture of grasses or anything like that so no no power and you are no 
weed grasses whatsoever. We just want a mono sward of rye grass. Mm. Um, and yeah, so we just sort of we do physical treatments to reduce that um, organic matter level. Right, Lawn Culture Australia, I told you about them before, but this is a new and exclusive group launching on June the 1st. What is it involving? Well, if you are a member, you get access to weekly and monthly prizes. These are great things like cylinder moles, rotary moles, air rays to thatches, and these are talking about, we're talking about reputable brands here, not something random off the internet. But not only do you get access to those prizes, well, obviously you're part of a great community, like-minded people. You also get access to personalized education, Events like our Hunter Valley event where they are uh, the name brand sponsor for the event and also discounts with partner brands on tools and products and things like that. Uh, another benefit though is that they're giving back to Grassroots Sports Club. You can see more information on their website. If this is something that you're interested in, jump on the link below, sign up. I'm really excited by it. And if nothing else, I'll see you at their event in the Hunter Valley with us. So what what would the maintenance schedule i mean i'm i'm feeling that there's probably a lot of i guess feel and experience in it um as well as kind of i guess a bit of a program you might be doing but like how often would you be applying a just a product in general anything from a fertilizer all the way through yep. to uh wedding agents whatever Yep. So we run two different sort of um, seasons with the types of products. So through the winter, I'm happy to use granular fertilizers. That'd be a slow release. That'd be sort of a 60% slow release. So 40% up front and 60% slow release. And that's a NPK of say 2420. So 20 nitrogen, uh, 4 phosphorus and 20 uh, potassium and I sort of try and run a one-to-one -one ratio of N to K um, and that's a granular program in the winter um, because we bring our height of grass up to 32 mil for winter sports for rugby in particular and so the granule can be applied and then it sort of nestles in amongst the sward and it can be washed in and it doesn't get damaged or anything like that through traffic and maintenance yep. whereas in the summer we're bringing our heights down a lot lower we're sort of down for cricket as low as 12 mils yep. so i don't like using granular products there not we can go to smaller sgn size so we can go down to greens grade 75 sgn from a 240 yeah. say um larger pro but we have so much traffic out there in the summer I don't like to break up or um, damage a prill, even if it's a DG dispersible granule. Um, I just like to use foliar applications of um, nutrition through the summer. Yeah, We could have rollers going out there all the time. We have portable pitch, so we've got transporter movements. Um, we've got big heavy machinery and everything. So I just find that the foliar applications, and in terms of the frequency, in the winter, we're probably looking at about every six to eight weeks depending on the the schedule and the draw so the traffic can affect um the vigor of the plant and it yep. might be that certain times i need more vigor to manage the type of traffic that and schedule that we've got yep. so at the moment we've got four games in a row we'll end up with super rugby super rugby then maybe quarter semi and hopefully a final so it'll be five weekends in a row. So then for, I've just timed a granular application for next week to try and get us through that next month and a bit, anticipating, you know, week to week to week footy. Um, but there'll be other times where I can lean it out a little bit because there's no point in growing grass if you don't have to grow grass. It just creates organic material and um, unnecessary growth um, that you need to manage. So just need it to be enough to manage the traffic that it's likely to get and to sort of grow any sort of whether it be disease or anything like that potentially out as well so we're sort of closely monitoring that growth rate and then relating it back to fertility what is the best way to measure the health of the lawn uh, a lot of people do it with clip rate so you know if it's a uh, if it, and, and understanding what you're planters as well so at certain times of the year it's going to be growing more often than another um, and just understanding 
what the clip rate is. Is it relative to fertility or is it relative to seasonality? And so there'll be certain times where plants almost go semi-dormant, whether it be summer mm -hmm. or winter. And so you, you're understanding the vigor of that plant through the clip rate and then designing a um, fertility program based around when you need it to be vigorous um, and resilient. And um, yeah, just usually trying to understand the plant you've got as you're desirable. Is there anything like, um, I've, I've seen people in the sort of food growing industry, you know, farmers, um, home garden, you know, enthusiasts who are growing their own food and very serious, um, use a bricks counter. Do you know what I'm talking about with bricks there? No, not yet, but I'll look it up. So I don't know if this has any relevance to grass, but they, what they do is they take some like leaves, say of wheat or whatever, and then they crush them up in a garlic press, like literally what you'd use in your kitchen to get some juice out. They put the juice in this little, uh, it's like a tube, like a sort of test tube size thing. And you can look through it and it will give you how much sugar is in the the plant, basically, or carbohydrates. Yeah. And so from a food perspective, it's a way of measuring how healthy the plant is for eating or how nutritious the plant is. And I was wondering yeah, right, eh? I was wondering if that had any relevance in turf because I know obviously we're not eating it. Um, cows might. If you let, I don't know if you've, if you've had some wild wildlife in the uh, in the stadium, but the um, yeah, like it's it's. I wonder if there's any relevance because it's just carbohydrates, right? So maybe that would be a sign of. I'm thinking out loud here, but yeah, I don't know. Do you think that would work? Um, oh, I'm sure it would have uh, some interest to people to maybe to relate uh, what they're seeing on the ground and using at the moment as a as a way of. Uh, measuring the timings of fertility and then they could maybe validate that through a secondary um, mode which could be that sort of testing and then you could start to say okay well there's correlation when i see these numbers and when i'm seeing what i'm seeing on the ground they both mean need a feed and so it's probably just backing up what is your natural intuition and experience yeah and i wonder how much how often like we overcomplicate this because i'm just thinking out loud here right but now i've thought about it i go mm. if you've been doing it for 24 years a certain way you don't have problems you know how how often do we like make things too complicated I, I'm, are you prone to doing that oh we can often make them very complicated but in doing it here for say over 20 years while i don't think i've ever replicated um one year into the next the the schedule is so completely uh different every year while we may have the same content the the gaps are different the timings are different um so we're sort of trying to continually deliver the same outcomes yeah but we do it differently every year and so that's why as bizarre as it sounds you can sort of stay here for 20 years and still be learning new things every day or every year and because there's no two years the same yeah, and I can imagine the weather would play a massive, especially like um, with, I mean, you have some big fluctuations here and there, and all of a sudden the plan that you had from last year that worked really well is just completely irrelevant. Oh, 100%. I mean, we've had summers with, you know, 800 mils of rain, and we've had winters with 400 mils of rain, and we've still averaged 1,200 for the year, but they've come at different times. I mean, last year, I think, Last summer we had over 800 mils, and then we had a an extremely dry summer, uh, winter, and now we've gone dry again. I mean, I think it was late January in 23. We were here at Eden Park. We were one meter underwater for nine days, and so we were wow. flooded completely midsummer. We had um, it was just never been seen before a one in 205 year event that flooded Auckland. And we had clear blue sky days, but we were underwater by a meter um, with water, groundwater. So it wasn't water running across the top of the surface. Yeah. This was the, the groundwater came up. And so every crack, crevice, drain was actually reversing water up 
yeah, as opposed yeah. to draining water down. And so it was just trying to calculate, like the tide, how long we would be before we were actually back down to below ground level for the water. And it took nine days. And then nine days later, we had Ed Sheeran concert. And so, oh my goodness, went from what? Yeah, so, <laughs> Yeah, that was crazy, crazy times. Yeah, so, trying to convince them that we could still deliver it. So, so nothing would be alive after that, right? Like it was drowned and then squashed. No, everything. Very weak, very um, uh, uh, sort of sodden. Um, and so, while some areas did recover, some certainly didn't. And so, yeah, that was a surface replacement. Post Ed Sheeran's uh, concert, yeah, uh, yeah, that was in February, February twenty-three. Man, yeah. that's there's some uh, there's some interesting stuff that goes on, eh? Like a flood. What yeah. did you have any games scheduled for that time? Uh, yeah, we always have games scheduled. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, like, uh, it, it, so yeah, you coincided with something. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we'd had the concert um, booked previously. So the flood came about 12 days before that. We ended up essentially putting, starting the stage build just as the water was lapping at the edge of the oh, field. Yeah. And he came in, he covered the floor, uh, covered the, the field with a drivable floor, did his two shows and left. Field's dead, but we have a um, turf farm that has a replacement field um as a contingency so we were able to replace the entire field after his show and then went on to deliver just the normal international cricket and super rugby program for that portion of the year and then just roll back into oh and then we had fifa yeah so we had <laughs> fifa world cup straight after that so, that's yeah. right Mate, they oh gee yeah. that's a lot going on uh, just in my mind right i reckon there'd be some guys in the super rugby team who who would have been like I'll play in that, you know what I mean? Like a meter yeah. underwater, let's give it a try, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, because our ground is convex, um, <laughs> the highest point of the ground's in the centre where the, the yep. portable cricket pitch is, and so it was like an island of of grass, and then the rest of the field <laughs> was this perfect symmetrical. You could have rode a, like a a rowing eight in there, and. So this should have happened brilliant. with the refs. A ref should, the ref should yeah. be in a boat, right? Like yeah. a little oh. <laughs> a dinghy. <laughs> the, whole, the whole stadium was underwater. What we des- describe as ground level was was underwater. So our, our maintenance sheds, my office was two feet in water. Um, the whole place was still is still um, ongoing uh, remediation now. A year later, it's it was significant. Gee, <laughs> yeah, but Crazy. I can. I, I I would uh, you wouldn't have an audience. You would have to just have the the players on the field and the, and the relevant staff. But that would be an entertaining game. Do you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't count for anything. But it would be it would be really fun to have one section where you could actually run and then to get a try, you have to swim. If you, and you if have you to go back online. The they're almost under the water just to yeah. You'd be floating back up again. Yeah, there's a test match here, All Blacks versus Scotland. I think it was 73. If you go online, you'll find it. It was the underwater test, and it was similar. Okay. So there's footage of that. What was the, the All Blacks? Yeah, that was Scotland. Uh, would be, see the I'm 75. I think it was 75. 1975. At Eden Park. Yeah, let's see if I can get a YouTube video on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty... Um, oh, do you know what? It is on here. Let me see if I can get this on. Let's turn this volume off. But, oh, mate, that's... um. Give me a second to do this. Yeah. The things that happen, you know, and people still try and, you know, uh, yeah. make but it But all work. these things, so 20 years, and you've kind of seen most things in that time, it provides you confidence to sort of not be sort of too shell-shocked with anything and then if you can sort of show that confidence other people around you will will feed off that and so there's not too many dramas 
Well, can you yeah. see that on the screen there? <laughs> yes, that's it. That wasn't last Mate. year. That was nineteen seventy-five. No. Okay, here we go. We're gonna get some um some play coming up in here, but yeah. mate, that's a there you go. That is that's... that is but it would have been entertaining. Come on, you want to be in the crowd <laughs> and you tell your grandkids about the time you were at Eden oh. Park when it was it was actually it wasn't Eden Park, it was Eden Pond. That's what yeah, they were playing. That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's great. People look it up yes. if you if you're watching this on on uh, Spotify or you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts wherever you're listening to, that's good. Come on, like that's a good memory. Groundskeeper had a heart attack, but it was a good memory. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. he's he's still still in a straight jacket. <laughs> <laughs> he's never emotionally recovered from it. Oh, oh mate. No. But you know that's um that do you know what that reminds you of that just reminds you of being a, a an eight year old nine year old boy and still wanting to play at school do you know what I mean that's the essence of yeah. what sports about having having a good time the commercial side and everything you know it's got to exist to actually you know deliver the the show to everybody on TV but at the heart of it you know it's just guys wanting to play a game you know yeah that's what you grew up playing down at the the community ground and then. You brought it to the stadium. Do you ever? I know I would do this. Do you ever, when you've set up the uh, the rugby or the, or the soccer, just um, have a couple of shots yourself on the field and just? Oh, we we always go out there and uh, replicate, uh, even if it's a twenty eleven uh, goal kick. Stephen Donald that won the World Cup final. I know exactly where that spot is and see how many times you can knock that over <laughs> wearing a small shirt. <laughs> Have you ever gotten it? And, oh, yeah, you could. Yeah, with no wind and pressure, <laughs> with no crowd. Yeah. Yeah. I've always... And we'd love the, the penalty shootout. You know, that's always good fun. There's a fair few people that rate themselves as either mm-hmm. goalkeepers or, or spot kick takers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've always wondered, um, you get these people who are in the crowd who get very animated and yeah, um, animated too gentle, you know, insulting, disrespectful to, to the people on the opposition team. I would love just once for them to find, say it's Australia versus New Zealand in the rugby, Find somebody, can't be an old, frail person, find some 40-year-old who's overweight, the most vocal aggressive person and just go yeah. mate you're up you're on <laughs> we're subbing you yeah. on and one from each side do you know what i mean and and just see what happens and that'll be the halftime show say there's a friendly <laughs> or something and same with cricket that yeah. that would be so funny to be like there's some australian having an absolute you know slag off at at Bolt or whoever, yeah. you know, and and yeah. they're like, okay, your you, keyboard warrior, yeah, exactly. Then... You can go out in the middle now and face Mitchell Stark, or yeah. even just see how you'd go with a spin bowler, you know, and just see. Yeah. It would just be, wouldn't it be fun? It would just be fun to see. And yes. No, it never happened, but I'd love it. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they're elite, and you know they. I think I watched this thing on Steph Curry the other day, and so everyone's amazed how many three three-point shots he gets but the shots that he takes in a game is about one percent of what he practices yeah so you know these guys whether they're cricketers footballers or rugby players the the training that they do allows them to perform you know most of the time on the in the public arena so that's what they're trained to do so you know with I can't knock them. No. And you would see them up close I mean, obviously it's your job. But you can probably get just about as close as anybody else uh, and get a real view of it. And me sitting on, you know, my backside on the couch watching on TV, you don't get the feel of it, you know? No, they're, they're, they're true prof- professionals. And so, you know, while they people highlight some of the things that people do that might not be perfect, in terms of what they're trying to do, they've got a short window to be the best they can be and probably – do the bulk of their earning in a window from 20 to 30, they're, they're going to train the house down. They're going to be as good as they can be for that short window they've got. And 
you know, they're pretty focused and, you know, when you talk to them, you can tell they're pretty intense people. Have you ever been to the Wacker yourself? No, not to the Wacker. No. So back when... The, I like it though. Well, uh, so do I. I kind of wish that they... Um, Optus Stadium's... I'm from Perth, so but Optus Stadium's way better as a stadium, but the Wacker is something about it for cricket fans. But I... Um, Back when I was a young warthog, uh, I used to go to the Wacker and watch the games and the practice nets yeah. were um, right where you would line up to go through the, the, the gate that's got the cheap seats yeah. that I could afford. And um, yeah. that's the the only time that I've really had to experience. So for those who are not aware, outside of the stadium, there's often actual cricket pitches that are in nets Mm -hmm. and the the players practice on them, warm up, uh, do a bit of training drills, whatever. And at the Wacker, where you line up, so like the path is two Mm -hmm. meters, a meter and a half from the the back of the net. Training nets. And so it's not like you get a full clear view because there's a couple of things in the way, you know, like the fence and stuff itself. But that's you get a feel of how fast the bowling is. And I remember as a 16 year old going, man, this, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. I'd be scared. I would be scared. Even fully padded up, give me every single bit of protection possible. And, you know, you probably could get your bat on it if it was, you know, not doing anything fancy, but just blocking, just hoping for something, but there's no Mm -hmm. way I could actually, you know, play. And as soon as there's some deviation off the pitch, man, I'm, you know, you, you get what I mean, like I've I've seen it thousands of times, and I still wonder sometimes how the likes of, say, a Kane Williamson can create this imagery that he's got time, because <laughs> there's very little time. I'll give you that tip in terms of when it say it leaves uh, Lockie Ferguson's hand in the nets to getting to Kane Williamson, and he still looks like he's got time at you know one forty five, one fifty five. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's a special skill. <laughs> Mate, it is. And then you put in a bit of swing. You put in a bit of, you yeah. know, a couple of cracks on the fourth day. It's um, But it's not like the bowler's even telling you where they're going to land it either. So <laughs> it's not like, hey, here's a heads up. This one's going to be full outside off. Just put it between cover and extra cover. Yeah. It's, you know. It is. Have you ever, have you ever, because I would as well, you know, I was talking about having a shot at goal. If Kane Williamson's in yeah. the nets, I'm. I would like to bowl three balls to him and try my best, and just. I would love getting tonked. Do you know what I mean? Like I would just. Yeah. But yeah. it would be fun just to be like, how how bad am I actually? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, but he would be dominant. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I haven't I haven't played cricket against those guys. I played to a reasonable level, but that level was a long time ago and you think you're way better than you are when you're lucky enough to see up close the elite and then you sort of go well I was nowhere near as good as I thought I was yeah they have this thing called talent which I'm lacking um so you know oh but but also access to high performance and just this it's their job you know and they're that's, they work hard as well, but the fundamental starting blocks were not even there that much for me either. So <laughs> even if I had that access, we, yeah. we yeah. maybe I'd be able to hit two balls in and over instead of one, you know? <laughs> It'll be an experiment. We'll bring some kid through with no talent and see if we can get them in the Black Caps or the Australian cricket team. It'll be a documentary for Mate. For a ten-year project. Well, it it happens all the time. It's the wealthy parents' kids, isn't it? You know what I mean. <laughs> they oh, yeah, still I mean, getting the team, bro. <laughs> yeah, oh, around here there's a few delinquents that make teams, so it's, it's all all fair. And then on the other side, you get some kid on the outskirts of some random village in India who just has some talent. Someone finds him and all of a sudden it's like, gee, this guy's good. And they've never had any formal training. They started at 15 or something like that. And what yeah. the heck? Some people just have it, you know. Yeah, you, could, you could pick the next um, Indian cricket team from YouTube or TikTok now. You look at all this, just, yeah, you'll get down this rabbit hole of watching nine-year-old kids with a Virat Kohli uh, batting style. <laughs> They are good. 
They are good. I mean, I, I've personally, like when I'm, I feel like India, there's, they've got problems in terms of it's too popular. It's too, I, I wonder yeah. if you took the stress and the expectation off the Indian players' shoulders, how many 11s, just because of their population, and, and if you could, I don't know, get AI or some magical machine to actually pick out of the most talented people out in the outskirts that no one's ever heard about, how many 11s could they actually bring that would be competitive at an international level? I reckon it would be 10, 15. Yeah. You know? Oh, there's, there's probably people with 30,000 first-class runs that probably haven't played um, in an Indian trial match, you know? So Yeah. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, they are very good. And you know, but we're yeah, but we're better, and uh, that's that's proven by the World Test Championships. So there we go. That's all I need to know <laughs> at the moment. Yes, but don't, don't don't bring up anything else. Don't bring up them beating us on home soil or anything like that. All right, just that's the one game we're going to look at. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, that hurts still. Gather, I think. Yeah. Mate, so um, let's talk about craft. You've got a Toro hat on. Is that the that they're, they're the mowers that you're using, or on the side? Yeah, I mean. we've got a relationship. Yeah, with Parklands, and so they're the sort of New Zealand agent for um, Toro, and we have a pretty close relationship where we use all of their products. And um, yeah, they're pretty good. And you know, we we have a multitude of machinery, and we sort of try and keep it up to date as much as possible without sort of over over complicating things either um so we have you know maybe an eight blade two eight blade reels um five unit machines for field one and we have an 11 blade unit on the outer oval where it's sort of cricket specific heights are lower and we actually use a cooch grass on the outfield yeah on our outer oval because it's a cricket only venue so mm -hmm. we don't have any sort of winter on it so we're in Auckland we're lucky enough to be able to sort of grow both albeit that we do go quite dormant in the winter for the cooch but on the main ground we're ryegrass only because a lot of the content is through the winter and we just won't get mm. that sort of uh, resilience and recovery um, we have a lot of shade in the stadium field as well so we're sort of ryegrass stadium and cooch on the outer oval so different sort of equipment for for both and different maintenance and different irrigation practices and different nutritional programs yep. disease management so it's quite good that the guys that work here have um developed a skill set to manage sort of multiple um sort of uh, yeah. varieties of grasses so that's good so how So summer, we're probably five to six days a week in the uh, stadium and pretty much seven days a week on the outer oval, which is our first class cricket ground. Mm -hmm. um, Mo, 11 mil on, in the cooch in the summer. Um, and in the, on the ryegrass out in the summer on the stadium field, we're probably, I hold it at about 19 mils. And then because we change... Um, codes pretty frequently that's just a holding point to then head in a particular direction depending on the next right. scheduled match so for cricket we'll dive down to say 12 have it at 12 for a for cricket match and then we might bounce back out of that and head back up into the mid-20s if we've got say a league or or super rugby coming up and then so we manipulating and managing the growth rates of the ryegrass in particular in that summer period to try and um, best anticipate what our schedule looks like. And so plant growth regulators, while people will use them on a growing de degree day program on, say, a golf course situation, yeah. I have to do it on a, a rate that I know that it will last for a particular amount of days, and then I have to be able to pull out of that and then have the, have the grass grow again and then dive back in to uh, growth regulation to try and make sure that we can hit high quality, real low mowing heights. And same with concerts where we start to put flooring down. Sure. I need to have it regulated 
for the concert and the floor, but then I need it to bounce as soon as we pull the floor up and then recover. So it's sort of, yeah. So and, can you uh, explain, yes, so I know what a plant growth regulator is, and I think a lot of my listeners would know in the, the basics of a plant growth regulator that you, you apply it and it slows down the growth of a plant. But a lot of the listeners on this program, uh, they won't have that deeper knowledge. So, so what are you really trying to achieve? What does a plant growth regulator do? What are you really trying to, like, why would you put it down at all? Why not just let it be natural? So for us, what it does is just regulates the kind of almost upright growth of the leaf of the plant. It restricts the leaf growth, but without restricting, say, the energy sent below ground. So therefore, roots are still active yeah. and uh, vigorous, yet the leaf is um, is sort of regulated in its growth. It just sort of shortens the um the length of the plant yeah. and sort of dwarfs it a bit. So what that means is you get a tighter plant, you get not the same upright growth. So sometimes you're not having to um, ma- um, mow it as frequently. So you just don't have this growth going up and up and up and you feel like you're continually mowing it and, and wearing it out at, in certain places on our field, in particular with turning areas and shade and things like that. Yep. Um, and it has a little bit more uh, drought tolerance and disease resistance for us and our plants. So hence, we, we're using plant growth regulators from November through until March. So then there's, there's negatives to it in that if you're applying it at the wrong time, so when you want it to be growing, coming out of mm-hmm. a stadium or something like that, if you've gotten that it's- application wrong you're going to have some problems. Yeah, you could have traffic um, coming onto the surface while you're highly regulated. um, And then it might not have the uh, ability to grow out some of the damage that could be caused through that event. Uh, Hence, we're sort of trying to time it perfectly to have uh, regulation and then coming out grow and then it might be held and then has to dive back in and then out and where we're not quite as constant as a golf course putting green or fairway um we just have these sort of peaks and troughs in terms of use and recovery and um traffic right what's um what is the most what what is the first if you're going to start a program what's the number one type of product that you can't do without like what is the number one thing you're like this is this is the non-negotiable because you know i might change a little bit of this i might change a little bit of that you know pick a different product over another one well so when we start we start with the variety of plant that you want to grow so therefore what's the use type going to be where is it going to be established and um so that's critical Mm -hmm. and then you start to say okay well say for a stadium our stadium fields 100 percent ryegrass so which ryegrass are we going to use and so then we start to develop when is the field going to be most used um what's the growth habits of a particular cultivar Mm -hmm. um and then we'll start to narrow down you know, the, and select based on that. And so while we have a mono sward of ryegrass, I don't have a singular cultivar because then we're sort of exposed to one particular um, strengths and weaknesses of an okay. individual right. cultivar. So I have a blend of cultivars that throughout a 12-month season will have times where any one of them will be actively growing. And there might be times where one of them sort of sits down and is a little bit more dormant. But the other one is vigorous and so there's not one particular variety that will have 12 month of the year quality Mm -hmm. we haven't found that yet we've tried that and we find that for particular times that we're exposed to its weaknesses which we don't want to be so we just sort of have a blend of two different cultivars that at winter or summer are 
more actively growing and the other one fills up and sort of sits there waiting to become active again. And then you'd say, okay, so for ryegrass, it's a pretty needy plant, so it needs nutrition. So therefore we base it off our nutritional program. And then we say, okay, what are the things that are gonna cause it to become low quality? It's either events, traffic or disease and drought. And so we start to build those types of things. So we start to manage traffic as much as we can, but that's based on an event schedule that sometimes we don't have a lot of influence on. And then we can start to say, okay, let's be preventative in terms of our disease management. We know when certain times of the year we have high humidity and the plant could be exposed to a high risk period. And so we'd start to apply fungicides in a preventative way mixing them up between select uh between contacts and systemics and yep. different mm -hmm. um different sorts of um, categories within the fungicides and then we just look at making sure we're managing um irrigation to develop a strong plant and sort of understanding how it grows where the water needs to be what we're trying to achieve in terms of a root depth and things like that and so those are things, yeah, water, nutrition, and plant type, probably. So is there, is there, after 20-something years, are you experimenting with new products at the moment, trying out new methods? Uh, the basics stay the same, but there are an advance in technology with regard to the products that are type. Yep are now available within those categories so we're always talking nutrition 30 years ago 20 years ago 10 years ago mm -hmm. the types of nutrition and their delivery mechanisms are uh, advancing continually mm -hmm. um, the same with um, disease management same with uh, irrigation management not just so wetting agents but also the way that irrigation systems are now becoming more efficient and, and um, better at delivering an outcome that's going to produce a high quality plant and and even yeah just the remote applic or the remote access to them you know through the cloud through your phones through yep. tablets also the uh, able to digitally um, measure moisture contents within profiles so we're having uh, validation of what you're seeing being able to be captured with say a, a field scout moisture monitors and, and pogos and things like this that you can actually now develop irrigation programs. So there's just this managing water better. What's it? What's a pogo? Pogo is a, a stick. It's like a pogo stick. It, and it's got some um, uh, probes that you push into the ground and then it, it sends information wirelessly back to a, a portal, yep. which you can access on a tablet to then instantly map, say, the, the area that you're measuring uh, in terms of, say, moisture content, and then it can develop um, programs based on, say, information that you've already inserted on your irrigation system, and it can sort of design an irrigation program to get back to where you might need or have pre-prescribed as being ideal. Um, so it means that the information that you're putting in is accurate and you're not overwatering areas that say don't need it due to the microclimates of say a fairway a green or a stadium mm -hmm. field with shade different profiles different um, undulations and topography and things like that so it's just a a way to accurately capture data and then apply irrigation if required so is it just the water that it's tracking or is it like can, it, can it do other things as well or i i don't the, the, i don't use the pogo we use what's called a field scout which is just a different oh, okay. of a moisture monitoring system but i think they are trying to introduce additional um sort of measurements you know so if they've got a system that can do one thing they're sort of i guess trying to add to it be worth having a look at people are interested well i've i had um a uh, nadim from colin campbell chemicals on who uh they do you know fungicides and herbicides a lot of yep. for um uh like fruit growing but also for turf management as well over here in australia and he, yes. he was saying to me that certain golf courses are using these kind of tracking 
monitors it sounds like a different one to like drones and things like that to map out how much kaiku yep. is invading or what's even like um yep. disease pressure or nutritional needs or whatever so instead of say with a golf course where you've got hectares and hectares instead of applying mm-hmm. you know a a product over the entire surface they're applying it in select areas saving the money and the application More targeted yeah and getting yep. the same result so i was just yeah it sounds like it it's really cool stuff you know like i love how people are going down that oh they're introducing technology into maybe non-traditional fields as such mm-hmm. uh, i can remember seeing heat maps of golf course fairways and sort of trying to show either the uniformity or lack of uniformity of irrigation systems um and then once you saw that heat mapping you could kind of understand where areas might for certain reasons yep. grow different grass types be more challenging to manage um and so you know they're all tools that previously we were just going by eye and feel and things and this and so it's not replacing um people what it does is validates what people have maybe been saying for a while and you can use these tools to help you and they're never going to replace people but what they can do is help validate people i found i'm trying to find now because i saw i talked about this the other day i'm just googling a Robotic cylinder mowers that have been coming out. Oh, I'm not sure if it's mm-hmm. released yet, but uh, I'm trying to find a video while I'm, while I'm talking at the same time. That's I'm always challenging myself to do two things at once, or if I try and do two things at once. But there's these cylinder mowers, they're proper cylinder mowers, because I know that people will use these rotary mowers and be yep. like, oh, the rotaries it's- cut the same as a cylinder if you're using a robot and cutting every day. Like, no, it doesn't, mate. Like, yeah. It's close. Yeah. It's good, but not for what you're doing. Yeah. But I can't find it. No, but I, the, there's autonomous mowers, and you know some of the big brands have probably brought them out. And so some people fear them. Some people um, love the look of them. And again, it's not to think that they're going to replace people. What they'll do is allow people to lift the quality of the environment by utilizing an autonomous mower to take a person off that task and put them onto another. Mm -hmm. And so therefore Mm -hmm. what it does is lifts quality um, rather than reducing the um, labor resource. I was thinking like, I totally agree with you because as a business owner, it's so hard to find good stuff. And the reason is in this industry is, well, people love working these types of jobs you know, a select group do, but you still get crazy weather that you can't deal with. You still, you still get, you know, it's a very physical job. So a lot of people's yep. windows of time they can work in, uh, and you know, it's not till, till 85. Yep. Uh, right. But then the biggest problem is the pay, you know, in, especially over here, I don't know what's like in New Zealand, but in Perth, we've got a lot of mining and the, you can be a gardener in inverted commas, which is a glorified rubbish picker upper on a mine site for about 25, 30% more than you could be a crew leader at a, at a landscaping business actually doing decent work. So if, and that's two weeks on one week off, if you're motivated financially, or if you just need to, because there's a, you know, uh, inflation and all that sort of stuff, people will leave the industry for mining jobs or whatever. So we need yeah, these I robots. Always, yeah, yeah, but I also say in that respect that the people that leave for those types of jobs, the only thing they'll talk about is the pay. They'll never tell you how great the job is. And the people that stay in this industry will only talk about the job, how good it is, yeah. and they won't bother talking about the pay. Mm. So it's... Um, most people don't do it for the pay. I don't do it for the pay. You do it because like this, I wrote in my notes before. So this is, I don't know what I, I set out to do this from leaving school. This is my one thing that I said I would do. And so everything I've done is towards this. I would never go anywhere to, to alter this path. And so 
I have always thought of it as a career rather than a job. I've never called it a job. <laughs> and so to get get where I wanted to get, there's always it's always been strategic and a and a pathway. And so taking alternates for higher pay would not have got me to the ultimate goal where I wanted to be. So if you can motivate people like that and it's a career, not a job, there there'll be no problems. Yeah. I think it's very. It's, it might be. A, what was that? Yeah. Oh, it might just be a little bit like pie in the sky, but that's how I kind of worked. No, I don't. I don't think it is pie in the sky. I, I think. I think you're really onto something. There, there are people who are sacrificing the greater, more important things for twenty thousand dollars a year, and then what they do is because they're worked off their feet or they don't like their job, they spend that twenty thousand dollars doing things that are enjoyable you know going on holidays buying jet skis you know buying a nice car whatever and maybe they would be just as satisfied and enjoying their life and actually financially the same if they had the lower paying job but didn't need to or feel like they needed to go on expensive holidays buy jet skis and uh, you know put a turbo on their car or whatever it is that they're doing all our guys eight of them are you know, without, you know, getting too deep, I think they're pretty satisfied in their, in their work life balance and what they receive and achieve and things like that. And, you know, we don't have too many people seeking um, alternate places to work because we, you know, try to provide this balance. Um, It's hard work at times, but there's also times where we're able to, you know, separate a bit from it and other people take up the slack and then you return to provide that sort of um, energy again. Mm. I can imagine that that somebody who is, say, a, uh, you know, uh, the, I can hear the voice. The puck, you know, um, and uh, you know, it, I came from nowhere. Don't worry about that. I, I mean, in the sense of like retaining staff, but I guess sometimes it's, I don't know. Sometimes those country town golf courses too are are some beautiful, some beautiful places to work, and there's some people there. I don't yeah. know. It's just, I guess you, we're talking about a mindset thing, and everyone's different, and it's hard to quantify sometimes the values that are not able to be measured on a spreadsheet. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and everyone has a different weighting for them as well. And, you know, everyone's, you know, situation outside of their work is a little bit different. And, you know, some people have to do things that we wouldn't do and others do things that we'd love to do but can't. Yeah. If you have 17 children, I'm sure that you probably at some point would have to go down a different path, you know? <laughs> you mean the mines? I mean, I don't, maybe if mining money is not enough for that, you know. You're going to have to start an OnlyFans. I, I thought it was more like the two weeks away. <laughs> yeah, that's what you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just leave them with yeah. the wife. She can handle them. Yeah. Oh, mate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how sustainable that marriage would be, to be honest. 17 children. <laughs> and there you go. There you go, uh, Dal. You'll be, be right. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be busy. <laughs> Can you imagine the order at the KFC drive through <laughs> 17 children? Nah, oh, man. my nah, goodness. It would be two air fryers at home. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it would be. You would have yeah, – there would be a farm and it would be an entire yeah. an entire uh, <laughs> you know, process just to cook it all. You'd be running the good life with it. No. Yeah. Although, you know, I've got some friends who are getting into chickens – and uh, sometimes, yeah. you know, you get into chickens just for the sake of the chickens and, and the eggs are kind of the byproduct. And sometimes people get so many eggs, they need 17 children just to consume them all, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Can't give them away. Exactly. You've got, you've got yeah. like two dozen eggs, you know, three dozen eggs yeah. sitting in your fridge. You're sick of yeah. eggs, you know? But you love your yeah. chickens, so yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Have more kids. So, yeah, don't talk about <laughs> scrambled <laughs> eggs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. How, are you into uh are you into cause are you the sort of guy who the, you're like the mechanic whose car's never running right or or are you still really passionate about looking after plants when you get home yourself 
I do uh, try, but it's it's futile with a uh, big uh, German wirehead pointer dog, and he he's a, a brute on my lawn. Yeah, and so I it's tidy, but it's not uh, Eden Park. And, no. Uh, it's, but it is interesting to see the difference where you've got a lawn that's got six different grass types in it and you can kind of <laughs> then understand the seasonality of the plants and, you know, what goes up, what goes down, what fills in, what's what's a bit vulnerable. And, yeah. Have you ever considered hiring? You'd, have, you'd only ever hire a, good, a really good person, but is it like – is there a great lawn contractor around your area who does really good work and you just go, oh, I just prefer to just hand it off to someone. Mate, no, that would be, that. you'd never, ever be able to live that down. <laughs> there would be no chance. <laughs> that would be like a painter that gets someone to come and paint his house. I know, but I feel like sometimes <laughs> you say that, but as somebody who's had, my own employees mow my own lawn, even though I love it. At yeah. not very often, yeah. but it's happened about four or five times. And when it has happened, I've been like, I could also kind of get used to this. Do you know what I mean? Like, no, I'd be too critical or too. Yeah, true. No, yeah, I'd yeah. Do it, I'll, I'll do it myself, even if it's at nine o'clock at night. Can you um? Uh, take your professional hat off for a moment and uh, you told about being too critical. I'm sure there's been some stuff ups, some funny stuff ups from staff members at Eden Park, embarrassing stuff, funny stories. I don't want to name names, but um, while you're thinking about one, I'll throw myself under the bus here. I once set, I've told this story before, but you haven't heard it. I once set fire to my largest commercial client's facility. It was a aged care facility, which is like halfway between a, a retirement village and a hospital, right? I was cutting a hedge. I cut through a gas pipe and um, I had my headphones on, my work headphones. I walked to the manager's office and um, I was like, hey, so I've cut through this pipe, blah, blah, blah. We walked back out again right and the gas has reached the pilot light of a hot water system nice. set on fire bushes on fire the in the the bushes next to a window that you know those windows that kind of open this way open out <laughs> the smoke has filled into the building and they had to evacuate a wing of the building which was it was like 160 rooms so it was about 40 rooms that they had to evacuate yeah. of very elderly un you know um, yeah. unhealthy people and uh, they called the fire brigade and everything and that is the most embarrassing stupid thing I've ever done in the entire lifetime I still managed to keep the contract I don't know how but uh, I don't know if anyone set, part, set fire to Eden Park but no, wonky not, lines, hydraulic no, luckily, leaks what sort of stuff's going on there well, I was gonna, there's a couple funny ones but like um because we change codes quite regularly there's uh one time when we'd gone from rugby league we did the warriors and so you have your 10 meter dashes and 10 meter lines and then we went to super rugby it must have been like a friday night game then a saturday game yeah and then so we ended up changing the field markings and so you get rid of your um rugby league lines and then you put in so we had a 20 and then for rugby it's a 22 but on one side of the field we had a we still used the dash mark from the 20 and then we went to the 22 on the other side so oh. we had a, a 22 that was 20 meters long on one side yeah. and 22 on the other we played a super rugby game with it like that and then i went out and mowed and it was just like the I ended up with this wedge that shouldn't have been there. So you're sort of mowing and then you've yeah. got these like nice even. And then you notice that it's like something's not right. I've hit the paint here, but I'm two meters off when I get down the uh, other end. And when you're sort of miles away from the field and sort of it just blends in, you just sort of see it and you don't notice it. But when you mow it and you go, 
a 20 and a 22. And we played two super rugby games. Wow. <laughs> and did anybody else um, notice? No one. No. Nah. Wow. No one so you had. And then we had to wait. A until a diagonal line. Wait until the gap. Yeah. Two meters out from. So yeah. how, how, and I, on the I outer level. Of... Sorry, you go. Well, yeah, so no one notices because the pattern that we used wasn't a single stripe. So we used this block pattern. So it was all a light. And then the one coming back between the 22 and the 10 is a dark. And so it's not easy to pick. But when yeah. you're actually, you know, on the ground, you can pick it. But, yeah, so I played two Super Rugby games with that. And on, I think, the outer oval, it was would have been – this one would have been 20 years ago. And so we used to have an old irrigation system in there. It was a hydraulic system. So it had tubes running to valve and head, they called them. And they had hydraulic tubes running from sprinkler to sprinkler, essentially. And it was always live with pressure so that you program, you could program any individual sprinkler. Um, and we had domestic cricket on there. It wasn't televised, but um, we went up the road for smoker, came back and the, umpires trying to push down a sprinkler that's come up <laughs> just because it's always live in terms of its yeah. pressure it was the, like slips and so yeah. it was just yeah. one sprinkler so it was was it was it spraying or was it just popping up oh yeah oh my no, goodness water <laughs> uh, yeah, so. and then we had to sort of rush and disconnect this hydraulic it was and so it was designed to fail on so that you could see any failures on it <laughs> that was the that was a high-tech high system in, like, 2001. Oh, and yeah. So we've sort of moved, moved away from that system ever since. Um, Wait, did it get on the no, pitch not, at all? No, because the umpire, when it's, or one of the players stood in front of it so it wouldn't get onto the pitch. Oh, my from goodness. Oh, yeah, but, man. So we've come down the road. And go, oh, here we go. Here we go. God, yeah. that's... That's music. awkward, isn't it? Because they, they think that you But we stuff usually you have, up. yeah, no, but we usually have enough eyes and ears across most things to not be too crazy. Uh, but there's probably heaps of things I don't know. It's, you know, the guys probably go, how about we just keep this one on the down <laughs> low? <laughs> we'll tell him. Oh, mate. We'll see how it rolls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what to feel about that sometimes in terms of like when the employees do something that you don't want and then, you know, sometimes you're glad you don't know because all, all's well that ends well. But sometimes yeah. you're also like, how many, like, would I have fired this person if I truly knew how many stuff ups that they, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, no, no, we've never had anything like that. We just, we try and pick people that fit the group and fit the personalities of the others and you know we can sort of hopefully read people pretty well so oh, i've got a story all good. i got a story that we had a guy who was a lovely guy but he was the most accident prone person i've ever had working for me and i have about 15 stories from him of just things that he did like uh one of the things he did was was i let him he was a licensed spray technician and i let him drive a machine that we had made a prototype rack for that I was like, was holding a hundred liters of spray. And I was like, don't do anything stupid with this because we're just trying it out. And uh, we'd like, you know, anyways, we we're going to weld up something proper later. He wasn't paying attention and he went over a bump too fast and the uh, tank fell off and a hundred liters of barricade was wasted and yeah. but like there's plenty of stories from this guy but one of the stories that yeah. uh, that they never told me until many years after he had finished is he once destroyed the clutch and i knew this because you can't get away with this he yeah. once destroyed the clutch on a uh on a car we had because he left the trailer brake on and towed the trailer with the trailer brake on for a long time. And the wheels weren't screeching, but he was like, man, this feels really heavy. And he was just a bad yeah. driver with a clutch, right? So yeah. it was a two and a half grand fix, you know? Yeah. And I tell you, we have um, a farm ute that's a manual. It's the only one that we have, and none of the young guys seem to have um, learnt to drive a manual. So our farm ute is the 
the Punisher that ends up being going through clutches with the learning of young apprentices. I feel sorry for it. Well, what ended up, what I got told about about three weeks ago from an employee who's still with us who was in the car was that this guy was driving after we had replaced the clutch and he did the same thing and he rocked up to a site that I was supposed to rock up to and they got out of the car and they could smell the clutch and they had yeah. deodorant and they were unleashing the deodorant on the car to try and cover the smell before yeah. I rocked up and I, I didn't yeah. know a thing. I don't know if everyone went close enough to the car or whatever. Yeah. I never picked it. But um, anyways, later on that guy, I we didn't fire him, but we kind of fired him. We had a conversation where I was like, hey, look, mate, this is getting into the thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. I'm being honest. I don't think I've made any money off you in the year and a half you've worked <laughs> with me. Um, you know, it, either yeah. uh, there's going to have to be some level of divine interaction or, or what is it, divine, you know what I mean? The Lord himself is going to have <laughs> yeah. to stop these mistakes from happening yeah. or you should probably find a different job. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, yeah. mate, it yeah. was... I, it was mutual I, in the end. It yeah. was. It was. He was a nice guy, but I tell you what, it was a. <laughs> it's best here somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I remember another story. All these things are coming up once. We had a mulch company. We were, we were at a private school doing work at a private school, and they had um, installed a retaining wall that we needed to fill with soil and then mulch. And we needed a lot of soil and not that much mulch. And this guy, he was he was built like the Hulk. And so he was just shoveling this soil up this retaining wall, filled it all out, and then started doing this, the mulch. And he did all the mulch, right? And then called me after finishing it all and being like, I think there's too much mulch. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, there's like big mounds. And I was like, like okay, send me some photos. And he had essentially made mounds that were about 30 centimeters higher than the actual like retaining wall and i was like why didn't you stop at some point and he was like i don't know i just kept working but he worked for hours longer shoveling this it just didn't cross his mind that hey like something's gone wrong here and he moved all the mulch up there and they had to move all the mulch back down again and then what happened is so obviously, my wonder is a big unit. I mean, he was he had a lot of muscles and not a lot of thought process sometimes. Um, <laughs> but he, what happened is because obviously he, he had to move it all back down again, and then I, don't, I can't remember what we did. I think we put it in a different garden bed. But the mulch company had delivered the same amount of mulch as they had soil. That's how they'd stuffed it up. But we didn't pay for extra, so whatever. But then a big a big hit of rain came and all the mulch floated away down their drain and blocked their drain. <laughs> so anyway, they were really unhappy with us for that. But oh mate, there's so many stories. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, we're out there's few um workplaces that are quite so public where your work gets judged on TV. So we sort of try and make sure we're yeah. Most onto it, and you know, it's a, even even at work, it's a bit of a fishbowl where you know you, there's probably three, four hundred people on site any day, and while you can't see them, they can see you in terms of whether they be in functions, whether they be in offices and things like that. So you sort of just got to try and be aware that at any point in time, you've probably been watched, and then you're going to be judged as well. So therefore, yeah. we just try. And make sure that we're kind of onto it. Mate, I reckon your hiring process is probably a little bit more thorough at a stadium than at my small business here. (laughs) It's highly likely. (laughs) (laughs) As respectfully as I can put it, yes. (laughs) That's what you're saying. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is. (laughs) It is. It's um, good fun, but, you know, the the hiring process is one that you know you're going to be uh, with for a, a long period, so you've got to try and do your best you can. And and for us, it's fit. We just got to get people that fit, and then I can I can bring them up to speed. I can teach. I can get what I need out of them, but I just need to make sure they're the right fit to start with because I can't change that. 
I've got a question for you that I've asked a few people before, but let's say there was a fire at the equipment shed, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, nowhere else in the stadium, right? It's, a, it's I don't know, some magical fire that doesn't spread. And you've got enough time to run in and save one piece of equipment, right? What are you going to save? Uh, it's probably a couple of answers. There's two different answers. There's a PC one and then there's my own mindset because I've got my old 1973 Alfa Romeo in the back shed as well. <laughs> so... <laughs> Say no more. Next so, question. <laughs> <laughs> What's the so PC answer? Comes out first. <laughs> uh, I haven't really got past the alpha yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say the alpha. The alpha yeah. is uh, yeah. the fire happened when you happened to actually take it for a drive. <laughs> All right. So the alpha is fine. Yeah. Other than that, what actual piece of lawn mowing equipment or turf related equipment are you going to say? <laughs> Uh, I like them all. They're all. Uh, I don't know if I could pick one over another in terms of it being monumentally important over another. They're all linked. Uh, yeah, I'd hope they're all fireproof. <laughs> um, well, then, how about this question then? What if, because you use ride on equipment for everything, right? Right on in the summer and then pedestrian in the winter. Okay, so you're you're walk behind mowing, right? Yeah. So yeah. He, here's my question for you, right? You you can mow the field with a pedestrian mower, right? What how wide is your mower? Your pedestrian walk behind? Uh no, the Dennis ones, they might be Oh they're big. Big Dennis. Well, they might be 50 inch, maybe something like that. Okay. All right. You... So that might be one meet, one meter wide, maybe. Oh, one meter. A little w- bit less, I think. One meter would be 25 inches. But the Dennis ones are huge, aren't they? Yeah. Is it one meter, 25, oh, 26, but... something like that? 24, something in that ballpark. So let's. Not big and heavy. Yeah, so that's you got your one meter wide walk behind, right? And here's your options, right? You can either walk behind, apply all your products, or walk behind a mow for the entire year, right? So you can use a ride on mower, but a walk behind product application yeah. system, yeah. right? Or you can yeah. use a walk behind mower and a ride on application system because you're mowing more yeah. often, but yeah, how many times would you have to refill yeah. a twenty kilogram hopper? You know what I mean? Yeah, no. Nah, I would choose the walk behind mowing and right. then put everything else on using the uh ride on equipment. Because we do so much of the other applications and the accuracy and the yeah, just the uniformity. Yeah, I'd choose that. I'd so, walk. So then by default, I think we've probably got to the answer that you would probably save the big spreader or the big sprayer first because at the yeah. end of the day, that's the job that you yeah. really do. Yeah, fair. That's a good way of working it out. Well, what about, do you guys have Scott Bonners over in, in New Zealand? Some of the bowling greens do. So, you know, you might bowl, uh, use one on a... Cotchula Bowling Green, so, but they're big, heavy, and they're, they're a lot like the Dennis mowers, but they cut a lot lower, so yeah. um, we wouldn't use one here, but they do have them. Do you have a mow master for your um, pitch? Um, we have the Toro kind of equivalents, I guess, the golf course centric, the Toro ones, but we've got two mow master cricket pitch rollers. Okay. So those are from... Luke over there. Yeah, yeah. Good old Luke. He's yeah. down the road he's from got me. Lots of good, he's, oh, so he's got some crazy, amazing, specific turf equipment that, uh, you know, many people would think to create, but they've actually created them. And so it's like, um, yeah, it's it's a good story. 
<laughs> we did a an episode with um so we've done an episode with Luke and then Luke came to a little live event we did here at the warehouse. But also what you might be interested in if you've never been there, we did a video with Brenton from the Aussie Lawn, for those who want to look it up, where we did a tour of their little factory there in Welshpool. Yes. And uh, it's really cool just to look behind the scenes of how something's made, being made in Australia, you know, and obviously as Australia being proud of that, but like that just doesn't happen anymore. You know what I mean? Like manufacturing well, in these sorts of countries. You, the quality is ridiculously high and the, the customization is impressive and whatever you want, they'll do it. And so I said, I don't want the rollers green. I want them black. Mm-hmm. So they come over in this customized Eden Park black and the mint, the beautiful, the, the wonderful front. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and I guess all of the equipment's like that, all the scarifiers, mowers, brushes, anything I've seen. Well, I asked Luke this question, but he's obviously biased. So I want to ask you. Why why would you get a cricket pitch roller when they look pretty damn similar to like a a small civil engineering roller? What it is, you know, a road road roller. You know, because mm. I've seen local councils yeah. use the the cheaper road rollers. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. So the cricket pitch rollers they produce are very specific to to what you're trying to do is create a high amount of weight delivered over a small area um, to maximize that compaction sort of uh, pressure that they apply. Whereas a road roller is designed to essentially uh, vibrate a whole lot of construction profiles, usually stones. So they're quite wide. They actually have relatively low ground pressure, but they rely on the vibration component to rattle all of the components uh, tighter together and then they whereas cricket pitches we're not after any of that vibration mechanism within a roller we're after trying to compact directly downwards soil and then allow it to dry and become very hard yeah so we want that sort of what we'd call a rolling factor to be higher than what the road rollers can do and by having that drum comparatively wide on a road roller you end up having to do far more passes on your cricket pitch to get the compaction that you want and you find you end up um, wearing out your grass cover and stressing it out and just for the purpose of actually trying to compact things with a roller that's not actually specific to that task so hence their rollers are are narrow they're far heavier than they look and they provide this, you know, really high rolling factor, and we don't have to be on the turf as long to achieve the same results as you do with the, the other style rollers. Yeah. Do you feel like um, just being able to have a conversation with a brand as well makes the product a little bit better in your mind? You know, you feel a little bit safer sometimes. Oh, but you can. It's completely bespoke to what we want. If I want the weight to be different, I said I need the speeds to be different. I need um, uh, what else did I need to be different? A number of different things. Just and it's just like, yep, send me an email or let's have this conversation. He'll take some notes. Just whatever you need, they can do as opposed to a mass-produced, you know. Um, element or an item in a catalog yeah well blair we've been mucking around with technically (laughs) yeah i'm i'm starting to cut out now um hopefully you can still hear me people but i believe that my my whatever's gone wrong has really gone wrong because whoever's been fixing it before is not fixing it anymore. But we've got to an hour and a half. So yeah. we're going to have to wrap this up, unfortunately. I have about 50 more questions. But, um, yeah, hour and a half. Um, 
unfortunately, it's a bad way to end because mm, I have a feeling that something's going to crash here and I'd like to save what we have already. But, mate, I appreciate your conversation. And in a little bit that we've, we've had a good chat, you know, you're a genuine guy as well. And uh, I think that people in your role are some of the most underrated people uh, just in sports, period. But, you know, the fact that sports lovers like myself watch the game and, you know, how many they are and then, you know, very little praise goes to people like you. Um, I just want to say thank you from a sports lover for all the times that I've been able to watch a game at Eden Park on the TV, never been there. But, you know, I would love to just extend that thanks to you and obviously a thanks to coming on as well. And uh, I don't know, maybe one day in the future, you can have the second half of this conversation that I wanted to have oh, without any technical issues. Mate, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been, uh, I didn't realize it was uh, an hour and 33 minutes. It's gone pretty quick. But if you're ever over this way, we can do part two live here at the park and um, then we can walk and talk on the grass and might even uh, get to see if we can set these cameras up and uh, get it out there on the field. Mate, that would be, that would be, an absolute honor. And I didn't tell you this, but I think we will have announced it before this podcast comes out, but we're, we're doing a live tour. The people know that we're doing a live tour, but the live tour, we're doing our Adelaide event at Adelaide Oval. And uh, Damien Hoff's going to be there and it's a celebration for lawn lovers. And what you just described um, we're not actually doing the event on the field, right? That would be Damien would have lost his marbles to, to do such a thing. But uh, a certain person and myself, oh, it'll be announced, Ben Sims from Lawn Tips and myself, uh, before the event happens, are going to do a day in the life of a groundskeeper video and try and promote the excellent work you guys do. Ben's got 140,000 subscribers on YouTube, so hopefully a few people... Love that sort of stuff. And um, before you change your mind, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I don't know how I'm getting to New Zealand, but it's going to happen. I tell you, if you come to New Zealand and do it at Eaton Park, we're only doing it if we do it on the ground. Mate, <laughs> do, you, do you have to ask some bosses here? What did I do to, to deserve this kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, what's the word? Treatment. Surprise and delight. That's speciality here. Well, mate, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to book some tickets before you change your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know. Make sure it's close to a game so that we're uh, looking sharp. The only problem I have, mate, is there is no way my wife is going to let me go to New Zealand without bringing her along <laughs> too. <laughs> She's welcome. She can go shopping. <laughs> then, then there's two kids and it's a whole event. Yeah. But before you, before we we get, uh, commit to anything else, mate, thank you so much for coming on, and um, everybody else, we will see you in the next podcast. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, Shane here from Lawn Culture Australia. It is a lawn rewards club where you go in the draw to win both weekly and monthly prizes. Prizes consist of lawn care packs, cylinder mowers, rotary mowers aerators, dethatchers, and power equipment bundles. All things lawn care, all from reputable brands. It's not just about the prizes either. As well as the giveaways, you have access to partners discounts, personalized lawn education, invites to exclusive events, plus you'll be part of giving back to grassroots sports. This is not just for experienced lawn experts. Novice to fanatics, our club is for everyone. It's about getting outside and enjoying your lawn and being part of a supportive community. So come on, let's grow together. Join Lawn Culture Australia today.